um, uh, for the uh, for Tuesday, October 13th. And the uh, first thing on our agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Next on our agenda this evening is um, adjustments to the agenda. I have one I would like to add to item 10F, which is a request for maternity leave. I'd like to also add a request for child rearing leave. Okay. Um, I think as well we need to add a Keith under new business. Um, substitute pay, is that right? Can we That's add right. that as, yes. as um, item H? The other adjustment to this agenda, um, number 11, consideration of the superintendent's request to enter executive session uh, for the discussion of a legal matter that will um, not happen this evening. <coughs> Are there any other changes? Okay, we'll move on to approval of the September school board meeting minutes. the meeting of September 8th. Any adjustments, corrections, comments, or concerns? Seeing none. Um, we will move on to comments from the school representatives, and we will start with the high school. Hi, I'm Hello. Alicia Chang, and I'm one of two of the school board representatives from high school. And um, Jeff, unfortunately, couldn't be here today. But um, I'm just going to fill you in on some of the things that have been happening the past month. We had homecoming um, two weekends ago, and I think it went really smoothly and really well. We had skits put on by the various teams for, um, on Friday, on Friday night for the pep rally. And that, that was really entertaining, and it went well. Um, we also, the, um, on Saturday, Saturday day of homecoming, we had booths set up from the various different, um, from the grades to help profit their grade, and um, we had different, and the games went well. I think we won most of our games, so that went well. And then for in student council, um, we had our retreat, and we made goals for the year, which included to improve school spirit, and um, we want to have a community project by the time, um, sometime this year, which involves the whole school. Um, we met with a town council representative, and she proposed having two members of the senior class as representatives on the town council. And um, we, we <laughs> like that idea very much. And um, the seniors are going to have a meeting later this week to start the selection process on who those two people would be. Um, our fall show with the theater production is coming on well. Um, the rehearsals are done and we have the cast and there was, a, there was a very good turnout for the number of people who tried out for the show, which was good. And um, tomorrow night there's going to be a class rank meeting in the high school at night and that's just to, for parents or students or anyone who wants to you know, find out about class rank. And, um, that was recommended by actually the students who were interested to have it at night because they thought that there wouldn't be enough time during the, um, at lunch or before after school to discuss the whole class rank process and it's just like an informative meeting tomorrow night. And lastly, I think fall sports are basically halfway through. I think the golf team is already done and um, cross country has a big conference meet this Thursday. But besides that, I think most teams are midway through their season. And that's about it from high school. Okay. Any questions for Alicia? Thank you very much. Yep. Good job. Thanks. Now we have uh, comments from the middle school representatives. 
Hi, I'm Marianne Chapman. Uh, I'm Avelia Wiggins. Um, this middle school has gone off to a great start this year. Um, each grade level will be um, doing an outdoor experience this year. The fifth grade is also doing an I Can Make a Difference program, which they're recording their good deeds and how it made them feel. Um, there's two new fifth grade classes, and four fifth grade classes are in the dare now. Um, their outdoor experience will be one day at Camp Ketcha, which will be happening in late October. Um, there, that will include like physical challenges, sort of like the ones at Chewonki. Um, the sixth grade has just finished their annual Sally Foster gift wrap sale to raise money for Chewonki. Um, they're still awaiting the final count for the profits. Um, that's it. Uh, the seventh grade will be going to Camp Kiev in uh, November, late November. And um, it's called the Leadership Decisions Institute. And that'll include activities in the areas of drugs and alcohol, communication skills, and an adventure challenge. Um, the fifth grade parents' night for that will be October 15th for the Camp Kia. Um, the eighth grade is um, finishing up the planning process for spending a day at Chewonki. Um, that will probably be in November, but they don't have a definite date yet. Um, we will hopefully have more information on that for next month. Um, most of the eighth grade social studies classes have begun the junior achievement program, um, which uh, is um, there is one speaker for each of the seven classes. Um, that speaker will go once a week to um, explain their jobs and how to like pick careers and um, and how to get to the job they want and that will be for about eight to ten weeks. The fifth graders are uh, visiting the student council um, until their elections in November and the student council is also uh, helping out with the Pont Cove Halloween party, and um, that will be on October 30th. We're doing a candy walk, which is similar to musical chairs. Um, we had a seventh and eighth grade dance last Friday, or, <laughs> or something. Um, we made $575.70 after paying for the DJ and the snacks. Um, the first First, fifth, and sixth grade social will be on November 6th. Um, the middle school athletics teams um, is just about finished. We have a, about two more weeks left. Um, and the winter sports will be starting some, sometime in November or December. Recently, we tried out the uh, block schedule, which is 90-minute um, periods along two days. And um, almost all of the teachers I talked to liked it and said it was a lot more comfortable. Uh, the students was about half and half. The people who liked it said it was because there's less homework per night, um, longer breaks between classes, they learned more, and the people who didn't like it said that it was hard to sit that long and there's no snack or SSR reading and it was confusing. Um, um, finally, there's, we are just starting the um, sale of, cl the annual clothing sale that um, the student council puts on with um, just like jackets and everything. Um, it's with um, Coastal, Mena. <laughs> Coastal Maine Athletics. Um, and so that should be starting pretty soon. Also, um, progress reports go home um, tomorrow, so um, that's it. Okay, a very extensive report. We appreciate that. <laughs> Other questions? Thank you very much. Good job. <laughs> and I'll move into um, 
the item on the agenda, communications. Um, are there specific communications? We have one um, update on the Ann Ridge case. I have a communication regarding the uh, Ann Ridge case as follows. In what is now a second important development in the Ann Ridge case, the Cape Elizabeth School Board received notice of a decision by the Maine Labor Relations Board in the Ann Ridge v. Cape Elizabeth Education Association complaint dated September 8, 1998. The order from that case reads as follows. On the basis of the foregoing findings of fact and discussion, and by virtue of and pursuant to the powers granted to the main labor relations board by the provisions of, and there's a whole section of titles here that I don't know how to relate to you. Uh, it is hereby ordered that the complaint filed by Ms. Ann Ridge on July 7th, 1997, against the Cape Elizabeth Education Association be and hereby is dismissed. While this is a matter that specifically involved the unit, union, the board has received the decision and order from this case very positively in that the union has and continues to successfully identify and differentially manage those cases that are without merit. This follows chronologically the dismissal of the complaint filed by Ms. Ridge with the Maine Human Rights Commission against the Cape Elizabeth School Board. That is the end of the communication. Okay. Are there other items for communication? George, just a yeah. quick one. Uh, having three sons in the uh, Pond Cove kindergarten complex, I'd like to thank uh, Tom and all the Pond Cove teachers for the excellent curriculum nights that went on over the past few weeks. Uh, it was uh, seemed to be very well attended, and it was great to meet the teachers and, and see how things go. Okay. And one more, George. If no Kevin? one else has anything. No, go ahead. On a highly personal note, uh, Tina, Jennifer, Brendan, and myself would like to thank the members of the school community who offered their condolences on the unexpected passing of my mother. Your cards, letters, notes, conversation, flowers, and plants were a great comfort to us during a very difficult time. Thank you. Okay. Other communications? move on to the superintendent's report. <coughs> we have two requests for sabbatical leave for next year, one from Gail Parker and one from Jill Bell. Interestingly enough, they both are fifth grade teachers. So they've met the first deadline and their next deadline is to put together a packet of materials by November 30. And both of them have indicated they're not totally sure at this point, but that was their preliminary interest. So if the packets come in by November 30th, then we will refer those on to the sabbatical committee. Nancy, you want to speak to the next middle school physical okay. fitness award? <laughs> this is um, President's Physical Fitness Award. This is the award. President's Physical Fitness Award. I don't know if I'm a good representative to talk about it, but obviously people in the building in which I work are extremely physically fit. Um, and this is the second year that um, they have won this award. And actually we received notification of it and we didn't, um, the student, uh, one of the television stations, I think it's Fox 51, called me right up and wanted to know if they could come over and interview some people. And I had to caution them not to come that day because we hadn't had a chance to even tell the students they had won this award. But we do have badges for them. Um, 66 of our students um, had qualified. And in our category, which Andy and I were looking over the categories today, and there are three categories in the state, we believe that they are done by size, and we're in category three because we're just over 500. We have about 570 students. But of the schools in category three, we would be one of the smaller schools in that. So that means our students even did better than, than we might have thought. Although it's only 12.4% um, of our student body who took this. And this is all students in grades five through eight. Um, this is a competition that they do as part of their physical education program and part of the regular um, curriculum. And we do give out some awards at the end of the year, which we did last year, but um, our students who are currently in grades six, seven, 
eight and nine are the winners of this award. So we congratulate them very much. And um, it's very nice to work in a building with so many physically fit people. And if you ever doubt it, just come spend some time with us and you'll see all the energy right through the halls and all through their classes. So congratulations to them. Thanks, Nancy. We have scheduled a November workshop for the 24th, and that happens to be a no school day. So last meeting, people expressed interest. So I would recommend we either move back to the 17th, which is a Tuesday, or forward to the 1st of December, which is a Tuesday. And there's no workshop in December? No, and there is no workshop in December. That's correct. And do you want a date from us now? Well, everybody's here. Okay. This is a good time to do it. Is Anyone there... have a preference? No, either one. No preference. Um, what, what December 1st or? They're both Tuesdays. So it's move it back or forward. 17th? Technology is the topic. That's fine. So the 17th. Thank you. John, is, is, it all right? is that okay for you? 17? That'll be fine. Thanks. Everyone else is fine? Okay. Okay, we'll change that. Is that the high school library? Yes. High school library. Unless it's not available, and I'll let you know if that's okay. the case. We're assuming. Okay. Um, was this the, where we were going to do this? The uh, principal's reports. The goals? No, we have it down further under okay. new business. Okay, fine. Uh, we'll move on to the principal, principal's reports, and we'll start with uh, Peter, the high school. As Alicia mentioned, the uh, homecoming, I think, was a, an extremely positive event. Good time was had by all. But I would like to add a, a special thank you. It's, it's kind of a unique event in that it's um, uh, definitely school-related, and yet it's sponsored and put together by the various booster uh, organizations, and it takes a great deal of coordination. And I would like to take a, a second to thank Chris Bailey and Katie Fairbanks Cliff for all the work that uh, they did in working with the classes to uh, help them to set up uh, various fundraising opportunities uh, to uh, uh, organize everything from the skits to the potluck dinner. Uh, There's an awful lot of work on their part and I appreciated it in a great deal. It resulted in a, an event that, uh, that was really enjoyable. Um, the uh, student council uh, I think is off to a, a very good start and, and one of the <clears throat> Uh, initiatives that they would like to follow through on this year uh, is, is one that uh, Jer Clucci, the president of the Student Council, had talked with me about during the summer, and I wholly concur with him. Uh, and it's along the lines of the school spirit. It's, it's in the uh, same category as this, the school spirit goal. Um, but one of the ways that we think that that can be accomplished is by uh, presenting more all school uh, assemblies. And so we are working together, screening uh, various opportunities uh, from outside presenters as well as uh, talking a little bit about what are some things that we could do uh, ourselves. And again, uh, in a, uh, one of those uh, uh, joint sh shows, a show of joint support, the Parents Association hearing that the Student Council would uh, like to, uh, to have, present more assemblies uh, has uh, granted $1,500 uh, to be used uh, in, that, uh, in that effort. And I think that's a, that's a tremendous support to us and, and uh, uh, will enable us, I think, to, uh, when we need to go outside of the school for presenters, uh, will enable us to do that. Um, it occurred to me that this year that there, uh, for this time of the year, um, a large number of, of opportunities, uh, formal and, and some less formal, to get together and talk with parents in the, in the high school. Uh, last week I was looking back uh, to the beginning, uh, the middle of August really, and uh, in that time, which is uh, less than a quarter of the school year, uh, we've already had uh, four evenings or mornings uh, that were designed for parent communication of one type or another and another one coming up in about a week and a half. So there will be, it will have been five in the first quarter. Now I don't mean to say that we will maintain that type of pace throughout the, the year, but uh, when you start with the uh, parental, uh, the class rank information evening for parents, 
the senior college planning breakfast that was put on by Sharon Merrill and Belinda Snell in the, in the guidance office, the freshman barbecue, the uh, very successful uh, open house, and then the upcoming parent conferences. I, I really feel like there have been many opportunities uh, uh, to talk with parents about what they're seeing in the school, what their questions are, their concerns are, and, and I think it's been great. I've, I've really enjoyed it. Um, that leads into the open house. I think uh, we had uh, an excellent turnout. Used the uh, traditional format of a uh, uh, working through a son or daughter's schedule in an abbreviated uh, fashion. Uh, I think it went very well. Uh, all the feedback that I received from parents indicated that they were um, very well impressed with the kind of enthusiasm and energy that uh, the faculty had put into the evening and, and all found that it was a, a great learning experience and felt that they were more in touch with the programs that their sons and daughters would be uh, going through uh, during the year. We did drop out the sign-ups for parent conference on that night. In past years, uh, you may remember, uh, uh, those of you who have been through high school open houses, part of the, uh, each presentation was devoted to a small time for parents to sign up for uh, the upcoming uh, parent conferences. <clears throat> In looking at uh, that process, we realized that it really, first of all, took precious time away from the little time that we did have to explain the program. It was taking three or four minutes out of the 10 to 12 minutes that teachers had to describe their programs. And it was usually creating a log jam where uh, parents would still be signing up and then be late for the uh, next presentation. Uh, and we didn't feel that it worked that well and we thought that we could accomplish the same thing through telephone, uh, email, uh, conversations. So we have uh, sent word out with all the uh, progress reports uh, and in, in the Parents Association newsletter <clears throat> regarding uh, sign-ups and now uh, we are handling those sign-ups by telephone. The main office staff is uh, schedule has the uh, charts for all teachers and we're scheduling parent conferences for October 22nd and 23rd and we tried to arrange the times so that there was a range of, uh, there would be a range of options uh, for every parent that there'd be some early morning times for those that uh, that need to do it before they uh, go off to work some evening times and some late afternoon times uh, so I look forward to that and uh, as I say next uh, next Thursday and Friday um, Alicia mentioned also an important meeting tomorrow uh, evening, 7 o'clock in the lecture hall. The main focus of that is for students uh, to come to hear the various issues and express their opinions about uh, the class rank question. Uh, certainly we won't turn uh, parents away or other interested spectators, but the, the main thrust of it is uh, we had the parent meeting in, in mid-August and we will have a parents association meeting next Thursday, October 21st, at which the uh, class rank will be the main uh, topic. Uh, so tomorrow night's meeting is, is mainly aimed at students and talking with them, hearing their opinions uh, about the issue. Uh, we have kept the policy committee uh, informed in the first meeting and we'll do so also 30, Thursday morning uh, at the next policy committee meeting. Uh, we will report, uh, we have had faculty discussions now, parent discussions, and we'll have had uh, student discussions and we'll uh, uh, start formulating a, a recommendation. Still to be determined uh, and agreed upon uh, in the policy committee is exactly where the, uh, I guess, jurisdiction, for, a better, uh, for lack of a better word, is. Uh, at present, it's not a school board policy. It's uh, a, a high school practice or a guideline. Um, and so we still need to decide uh, whether that uh, will change or whether you would still prefer to have it be, uh, you know, we keep you informed and let you know what we'd like to do and, and then uh, you give your uh, blessing or if it's a formal policy. Peter, could you repeat the date, time, and place of those two meetings again? The, the meeting for students uh, is uh, mainly aimed at students is tomorrow night uh, at 7 o'clock in the lecture hall. The, parents associate, the, the next uh, parents association meeting will be Thursday, October 21st at 7.30 in the, cafeteria, uh, the high school cafeteria. And the main topic for that uh, meeting will be the, uh, our report on, uh, on the class rank. Uh, and uh, recommendations at that time. Peter, we're having a little confusion. Wednesday, is, the 21st is a Wednesday. So is it Thursday or is it Thursday the 22nd mean, or Wednesday the... I think it's Wednesday the 21st. I'm sorry. Let me see here. It's Wednesday the 21st, not Thursday, no.
That's project graduation Thursday. Uh, no, so it's Wednesday the 21st, Parents Association in the cafeteria. And finally, uh, uh, you, uh, as, as, as is normal uh, here, we, we have very full participation in our athletic program, but I do want to mention to you that it appears that the non-athletic activities program is reaching uh, new record levels uh, also. The fall production, as Alicia mentioned, is uh, underway now with a very good turnout uh, for uh, uh, auditions. Uh, Norm Richardson informed me today that he'll be taking uh, 30 students to audition for the Allstate Instrumental Music Program. That's uh, almost double. Eight, last year we had approximately 18 that were auditioning for that program. This year it looks like uh, 30. Uh, speech, uh, Sarah Franklin is working with 50 students uh, that are out for the speech uh, program and debate another uh, 25, 26 in that range. Uh, so uh, again, having tremendous turnout for all phases of the co-curricular program, the athletic program and the non-athletic uh, activities are drawing uh, tremendous, uh, tremendous participation. And there are new ones spouting up uh, uh, either by student initiative or teacher initiative. We're, we're, we have an environmental club uh, functioning right now that Beth Lewis, a uh, new environmental science teacher, has formed. Uh, uh, Amnesty International that Ted Jordan uh, has formed. Uh, a Free Tibet uh, organization that a student, Annie Tsoulikas, has formed. Uh, just tremendous amount of activity uh, that, that for, any, for anybody that has an interest. I think there's a great deal of support for that type of thing. I think that's it. Uh, questions or comments for Peter? Quick comment. Peter, uh, surprisingly, I've had 100% positive feedback on everything you've been doing in terms of the open houses. And the uh, parents, I have not had any negative comment. Congratulations to you and the staff. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Uh, Pond Cove, Tom. Good evening again. Um, I think I have to start on a rather somber note. It's been about almost a month since Pond Cove experienced the unexpected loss of a teacher. And I wanted to uh, publicly thank the quick response team, which rallied uh, together and provided so much support to Pond Cove during those days. I, I read somewhere you can't both do something and take credit for it. And like, I'd like to reverse that by mentioning specific names at Pond Cove, uh, particularly the night we found out about this tragic event Barbara McLean and Paula Harris, Sarah Berman were at school, kind of a, at a command post making phone calls. Um, since that time, the uh, remaining six, grade, six first grade teachers have been making daily contact with our substitute in there and essentially providing pieces of the curriculum. Uh, so they've been working uh, extra hard. And I just want to mention again, by name, Nancy Rollis, a team leader, Linda Nickerson, Gigi Zimprich, Kelly Hassan, Julie Mullen, and even our new, newest first grade teacher, Karen Abbott. In addition to that, since this happened at the beginning of the year, our reading recovery and general reading teacher, Becky Swift, had uh, organized an optional survey um, assessment of incoming first graders during the summer. And I think we got maybe 60 covered that way. Becky followed that up as she would have anyway, but uh, she was able to get into that first grade classroom, which no longer had <coughs> Lincoln Appy there. And with the help of Nancy, um, of Kelly Hassan, they were able to get a um, reading assessment on all the kids in there and get reading groups started. So I want to compliment her. And finally, uh, our stellar substitute, Nancy Skopinski, who has been there since the first day because Nancy is a regular sub and a very uh, valuable sub at Pond Cove. And she's been there every day with a smile on her face, I think just providing, uh, a, as well as could be expected, a good experience for the kids in that first grade. So thank you to all of those people. In the meantime, the uh, memorial fund that's been established has now grown to about $500. The Pond Cove Parents Association will contribute when we have more of a goal. Uh, members of Linda Nappy's family and representatives from the school will meet sometime over the winter and we'll decide how to put that money toward something uh, for the children at Pond Cove. In the meantime, as a, as a more of a short-term thing, there was an effort to uh, buy bulbs to plant outside the classrooms and they should be coming up in the spring. 
So thank you for all those who uh, handled the situation so well. Uh, back to more normal matters, I think you're probably aware that we're in our school review cycle. We've um, based a lot of our faculty meeting and team leading time, uh, team meter time on that, team leader meeting time on that. And just last week, the Pancos Parents Association sponsored an informational session about school quality review. I want to thank the four of you. Uh, I know you have very busy schedules for coming to that meeting. We're still committed to our original schedule. Um, the school's holding up in, its end of the bargain, uh, but I haven't heard about who is going to be on our visiting team yet. If all goes well, that team will be here for its uh, residency that starts on November 12th, and we're looking forward to that. Keith mentioned the uh, curriculum evenings we've done. Um, the format was different. We seem to tinker with it every year. Uh, feedback I've gotten so far has been very good. And uh, we'll, uh, I put a written survey out last week. Not too many responses yet, but it's been very positive. I want to mention looping every month just to let you know that it's still on people's minds. The um, ad hoc group that's also exploring um, having communities within the school, that is having a wing possibly devoted to different grade levels rather than just one grade is meeting. And the, peop the number of teachers interested in looping is, seems to be increasing. I had thought originally we'd have to wait maybe a year, you know, because we're usually a little tentative. It looks like we might be able to get something uh, together for next year if we have enough parent education and involvement. Um, Another thing that we promised to check on was the, our new health teacher, our K-8 through health teacher, divides his time between the middle school and Pond Cove, and we had decided not to lock Scott into a schedule that would keep him from doing curriculum work. So Scott sees the third grade one week and the fourth grade the next, which gives him some time to work on curriculum and to consult with teachers. And in the meantime, since he splits with Shari Robinson, in the media center, Shari's just delighted with this new schedule. It's uh, made the media center time more flexible, and Shari is able to work with individuals and groups on research projects. So I'm really pleased with that. Um, finally, uh, Wendy Dersewick, I think, has worked really hard on the Cape Elizabeth website because I'm getting uh, inquiries from people around the country about uh, who are thinking about moving to Cape Elizabeth. And if you haven't checked it out, it's capeelizabeth.com. It's two E's in Cape Elizabeth. And finally, I have to defer to Peter. I know he wants to go home and watch his beloved Yankees. Uh, there's plenty more I could say about Pond Cove, but Peter has to have his Yankees, so. It's easy to laugh when you're a Yankee fan. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? When we were interviewing assistant principal candidates, it was interesting how many of them had gone to the Cape Elizabeth website before yeah. they came to their interview and said, oh, they knew about us. Because One about said us. that uh, she would not dare park in that loop anymore, because I think that, month, that weekly note that I do is scanned in there so people can see that. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Well, I just wanted to say that from what I've heard from teachers, um, Tom, you deserve some of the credit for how Linda Nappy's death and, and uh, the follow-up and the response team, um, they've all sung your praises as to how well that was handled at school. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. And uh, last but not least, middle school. Nancy? Oh, you know, I'm glad you mentioned the least. I just, you know, <laughs> I, I wasn't in on the Yankee joke, but I'm a long-standing Red Sox fan. Um, however, this past weekend I did spend part of my time in Cooperstown at the Baseball Hall of Fame, and I have seen the bat display, so I feel pretty much part of the group. Uh, <clears throat> tonight, Amelia and Marianne did a wonderful job telling you about a lot of our events at the middle school, and one of our big events was our experiment with a maroon and white day and doing some alternative schedule things. We are having a staff meeting next Tuesday, and the major component of that is really to gather some feedback from the staff regarding the experience. So far, informally, I have heard from a number of people, and it's mixed. Some of them really enjoyed it. Some of them found the day that they didn't have a planning period to be very long. And I've heard from a group of fifth graders, two groups of fifth graders, um, a group of seventh graders, and a couple groups of sixth graders. And they also have mixed response. Um, but my favorite response was when I was talking to an eighth grade 
gentleman and asked him how the day was going and this was on our first day and he looked at me in that shocked way that eighth graders can and said, Ms. Hutton, this is going better than I thought it would and I didn't even have allied arts today. And so um, he was pretty excited. He said, actually he found that the classes went much faster than he thought they would and he loved the fact that he only had to prepare for three classes instead of four or five. So he thought that was a pretty good deal. Um, unilaterally across the board with all the students, one of their favorite activities was if you happen to have physical education for 90 minutes. Um, and that would be consistent with all middle school research done in the past 30 years, that that would hold true to be the right thing. We do anticipate throughout the year that we will try several different schedule um, experiments to really look at our essential question, which is, are we using our school time to the optimum? And the answer may be yes with our current schedule. We are ready to accept that that may be the answer. In talking with one of the faculty members today, she said it wasn't too bad because we do it every so often and we don't do it forever. We just, we try it. Um, I anticipate that our next trial will come sometime in late December or early January. So we look forward to those and we'll keep you updated as we progress through the year. Also, just encouraging any of the parents out there who may be listening, if you have particular feedback um, regarding any of our schedule experiments, please feel free to let us know and share that information with us as well. We are also looking forward to October 27th. Um, October is the month of the young adolescent, and that's us, so it's our month of celebration. And we do look forward to the school board workshop on the 27th. It will be in the middle school. We have advertised it that it will take place at the middle school library. And even though it will take place in other venues as well, if everyone comes to the middle school library, we can get you to the other venues. Um, basically what we're going to do is offer a middle school program fair for the first hour with about 10 to 12 booths. Um, they will be interactive, participatory booths. And just like a fair, people can wander from one booth to the next, um, but we will do presentations at 7, 7.20, and 7.40. Then we look forward to about a little after 8 o'clock, there'll be a brief overview um, in the library. And then 8.15 or 8.20, we'll have the team leaders will work as a panel of expert middle level educators, and they will take questions. And they hope to be able to provide answers to all of those questions from the public. That's the time, too, that I think will um, generate the questions about any scheduling things that we've tried, different kinds of programming. So instead of doing a lot of handouts beforehand, I thought we'd see what the audience generated that day. We have. I did mention this for the second time today at our Middle School Parents Association meeting. We'll be writing about it in our newsletter. We're going to advertise in the Cape Courier, and we're also going to try to get something in the Pond Cove newsletter. As many parents pointed out today, that quite a few fourth grade parents might be interested in finding out a little bit more about the middle school. Uh, the booths will be set up based on content, but when you go to the social studies booth, you'll see things for the um, content of social studies in the picture of five through eight. So um, we are working that. We, we don't exactly know what it will look like because it's still in the planning stages, but it's something we're very excited about and um, would like to try and present to you. And after that evening is all over, we would like your feedback on that too, how well it met your expectations, what it didn't do, what, we, what you still would like to know about the middle school, and certainly encourage feedback from the public as well. Further, um, Amelia and Amanda, um, Amelia and Amanda, Amelia and Mary Ann mentioned the um, progress reports that go home tomorrow and also family conferences. We are in the midst of doing those. Some of them have started. We, our effort is to try to get all of the family conferences done by the end of October. That doesn't mean somebody might not have one the first week of November, but we'd like to get everybody in there by the end of October. And I think information has gone home from advisors and homeroom teachers to all families. Outdoor experience, um, we are moving forward with that. As Marianne mentioned, we don't have a date yet with um, Chewankee for the eighth grade to go. We're still working with them on that. And they're still trying to make sure when their other programs end so that we're there at the appropriate time. But the fifth grade has made arrangements to go to Camp Ketcha during the school day on October 28th. And our seventh grade does go to Kiev November 30th through December 4th. We do have this Thursday Camp Kiev staff will be on our campus and they will be meeting with the students um, at, from 10.20 to 11. They will meet with the seventh grade advisors 
all of whom will be attending the Camp Kiev Day, Day program. They'll meet with them during their afternoon planning period. There's a 2.30 to 3.30 meeting for parents in the afternoon that have medical issues or concerns, and then the parent meeting at 7 p.m. One of the things about Camp Kiev that is different than some of our other programs is on Wednesday of that week, uh, which is December 2nd, they invite the parents up for the day to participate in the program in an early evening program. And I'd like to extend an invitation to any school board members, whether you're a seventh grade parent or not, to also join us that day. And if you're interested, we can get you the information um, for that. I think we're going to offer some school transportation up if a group of parents want to go. And I know people will be taking cars, and we encourage carpooling for that event. In that also, that effort, the Camp Kiev effort, we have an extremely energetic group of seventh grade parents who are out fundraising. And this Friday night, if you've had a busy week at work and you're wondering, gosh, what can we do for dinner tonight? Have we got a deal for you? You can show up at the Middle School Pankov Cafetorium anytime between 5 and 7.45 p.m. And you, for $5, you can purchase a wonderful spaghetti supper, which will probably be a culinary delight that you'll remember for years. So um, we encourage you to do that. What we're trying to do in our fundraising, and this is our first year with Camp Kiev, the first year is always the hardest. It costs $145 for each camper to go for the week. We are trying with our fundraiser to get that down to a $70 contribution from families so that fundraising um, will have done half of it. Um, we are, with our fundraising that we've done so far, we've received two grants from the CAPE Coalition totaling $3,000. We received a grant from the Middle School Parents Association for $1,500. The students um, raised $3,000 with bulb sales. The parents have raised $500 so far. Um, we have a marker, I figured it out, that we ha need um, $1,375 more dollars and we'll be at our $70 per person um, goal. So um, we look forward to that and I thank all of those parents who, um, during homecoming, they peddled those chairs. And I know that there are marketers out there because they walked up and down and they said, you look like you need a seat and have I got a deal for you? And they'd sell them a chair. So I thank them very much for all of their efforts. And I think that's our report for tonight. That's great, Nancy. Questions or comments? Thank you very much. We'll now move on to committee reports. We'll start with uh, the finance subcommittee. The chair is uh, Keith. Thank you. Uh, we met uh, briefly this night uh, before this meeting, uh, signed the warrants, uh, spent some time talking about the renovation project uh, in the 1930s building. Uh, things are going well. Things are coming in under budget a little bit at this point. Uh, I guess we have a completion date of sometime around the first week of December with community services moving in and getting up and going by uh, the time school resumes after the new year. Uh, we discussed briefly uh, some good news about our debt refinancing. Uh, with, with By getting uh, our loans at a reduced rate has uh, saved us significantly uh, in, in a couple of different areas, uh, over $200,000 over the period of our, of our current debt. Uh, we looked briefly at the audit report uh, done uh, jointly for both the town and the school district and just uh, simply say that our practices seem to be in good order and, and thanks to Pauline for all the hard work that I know that you have to put in, especially with the auditors. It's, uh, it's a lot of, a lot has to be done there. Our food service report, uh, we still have about $5,000 outstanding. Uh, uh, due from students uh, for lunches that have been charged. Uh, if, if you fall into that category, please uh, work on that and uh, track that down. Uh, we, uh, we, on our agenda, we had an administrative salary issue, which we've referred over to executive session being a personnel issue. Uh, we, uh, and the last issue we dealt with was uh, reviewing our substitute pay, and there'll be a motion and discussion coming in new business. Thanks, Keith. Um, an update uh, from the policy subcommittee. Kevin. As a rather lengthy hiatus, the uh, policy subcommittee met on September 16th. George was kind enough to come in and give us a summary of outstanding business. 
which included uh, guidelines on tobacco-free schools, school board roles and objectives, student hazing, advertising and booster support. Um, Pete has already reported uh, on his report to us, along with Sharon Merrill, on what's going on in terms of class ranking at the high school, and we will, Peter will be continuing to update us. Uh, we have not made any determination on where the jurisdiction for that policy will be, if, assuming it becomes a policy. Uh, all of the policy books have been recoded. Thank you, Ann Chapman, wherever you are, and Mary Bruns. Um, Claire was to present uh, to us special education policies. However, the federal, and st particularly the federal government, has been remiss in issuing the rules to implement their laws, and I believe they are 18 months behind, Claire, or something like that. Um, so they expect us to implement new law without telling us how we're supposed to implement it. Uh, and I guess we'll continue. We have confidence in Claire that she will do what has to be done. Claire and I will be meeting at some point, hopefully uh, early next month, to look at those policies which we least expect to change, and we will probably be uh, presenting them for first and second reading so we can get on with this. Um, uh, Peter, uh, Peter Dawson uh, reported that a new booster coordinator is being selected, and that when that booster coordinator has been selected, we will uh, rediscuss uh, the issue of advertising in schools and other booster support issues. Uh, the superintendent reported that a truancy policy was drafted some time ago but not implemented for some reason. She is resurrecting that policy for us to review with the uh, building administrators uh, for additional recommendations. Uh, Beth reported that the Maine School Management Association does not have a recommended policy of leave for leaves of absences, which we do need to be looking at. Um, we will be continuing to solicit information on other leave of absence policies. Um, Pauline has presented a, a new policy which will go forward for first reading tonight regarding family medical leave acts. Um, We've discussed the need for a policy on volunteers in the classroom and also the role of board members as volunteers in the schools. This will be, was tabled and will continue at a later date. Our next meeting is this Thursday, October 15th, 8.30 a.m. in the William Jordan Conference Room. That's it, that's more than enough. <laughs> One thing that um, Kevin, Neglected to mention is that um, Kevin uh, was appointed the chair of the policy subcommittee. So that's why he's presenting that report. Thank you. Um, update on continuous, the continuous improvement team that is focused on time usage. Um, Jen, do you want to do that or you want me to do that? I'd like you to do it. Okay. <laughs> Um, she bailed me out and gave me the dates. I had, had forgotten the dates. We did meet on September 22nd. This is the team uh, that is sort of a, a broad discussion, broad representation uh, with uh, parents, teachers, administrators, school board members uh, to really take a look at um, the best utilization of instructional time, uh, some of the discussions around staffing, uh, not staffing, uh, scheduling that you've heard uh, uh, this evening uh, from Nancy Hutton in the middle school, um, I think uh, was, an, was initiated, or some of the discussion that led to uh, the experimentation around scheduling was initiated in that group. As well, Tom spoke about looping, another issue that uh, found its genesis, I think, in, that, in some of the dialogue and discussion uh, from that group. Uh, one that I'm uh, personally excited about because um, we're continuing to uh, push the envelope a little bit and challenge uh, our mental models of how things have to be and, and, and checking to see if there aren't some more creative ways to um, get better use of our time. Uh, we did meet on the 22nd of September. The next meeting is on October 28th. And the time for that meeting um, was, Jen, do you recall? Did we say? Sorry, the 28th? It's four to, four to five. Four to, okay, 4 p.m. to five. And at which point we wanted to 
uh, really broaden that discussion back up again. We, uh, the last time we ended up reporting out on some scheduling, um, uh, some scheduling thoughts at the high school, middle school, and as well looping at Pond Cove, we want to broaden that discussion uh, back to where it was when we started and, and uh, make sure that we're not um, excluding other topics that are of interest to that group. Um, an update report on the review of staff changes. Now, um, actually, that's the way that it's listed on this agenda. Uh, the last school board meeting, um, there were two board members who um, volunteered to take a look at the facts and data behind uh, some concern around turnover, um, staff turnover in uh, the Cape Elizabeth schools. And that was uh, Jen DeSena and Marie Prager. So I'll turn it over to you for a report out. Okay. Um, Marie and I have looked into the issue of staff turnover um, this past year, um, uh, particularly at Pond Cove. We spoke primarily with school administrators, uh, teachers who left the system, as well as Cynthia Moles regarding the exit interviews that she had conducted. Uh, there appears to be many reasons uh, for teachers leaving, um, all different and varied. However, there were a couple of themes that did emerge, and those were issues concerning time, scheduling issues, and professional fit. As part of our school board goals, we're routinely conducting reviews of our schools that Tom alluded to. Um, we're, and considering the fact that Pond Cove is scheduled to have a quality review done this fall, we have the opportunity uh, to have an, an objective group of reviewers look into these issues as part of the school quality review and determine whether or not they remain issues that need to be addressed. And Marie's going to speak about the quality review. Um, as Tom had mentioned last Thursday, he did an overview on the Pond Cove um, school review that's coming up in November of this year. And there are um, three basic principles that um, will be looked at in this review, one being academic focus, the second being assessment and accountability, and the third being community. And I'd just like to read what the community um, description says. A sense of community permeates the school. Parents, teachers, students, and other members of the school community are partners in learning. All members of the school community are treated with dignity and are valued, honored, and encouraged and supported in their development. Um, we believe that through this review, if there still exist um, any questions of turnover or morale, um, they will be brought to the surface at this time. Other uh, questions anyone has? Okay. We'll move on to unfinished business, and uh, specifically, this has to do with second readings of policies. And uh, Kevin, I'll let you handle this. <clears throat> At the June meeting, we held first readings on a number of policies. This is the second reading, which is necessary for them to be adopted. George, help, because I'm not quite sure of the, uh, the actual procedure on this. Okay. In any event, we present for second reading policy ADA school district goals and objectives, which replaces the school mission, the uh, district mission statement and vision statement, and specifically requires this school board in conjunction with the administration to adopt annual goals for the, uh, the district and the individual schools. Uh, policy ADC, tobacco use and possession, is essentially, and for all intents and purposes, a reiteration that there is no smoking on school policy, our property, I'm sorry. Uh, there is no tobacco possession on school property by anyone under the age of 18 or a student, and there is tobacco may be possessed by anyone over the age of 18 who is not a student, but again, may not be used on campus. Those of you who are familiar with me will probably understand why I am so strongly in favor of this policy. So I reiterate, no smoking in, on, around school. 
ADC-R tobacco use and possession administrative procedure is simply the guidelines telling everyone what to do if someone is in possession or using tobacco on school property or in the schools, uh, including where necessary calling the police to address adult issues on campus. And finally, JIF, JICFA student hazing is fairly obvious. We are simply prohibiting any type of student hazing, period. Uh, do we need to do a motion on these? Drew? Yes, um, this is a second reading. We've uh, had discussion of these and uh, the, the board has had input earlier. Um, so what we need is uh, a motion to accept these new policies. I move that we accept policies ADA, ADC, ADC-R, and JICFA. Second. Beth? Um, discussion? Questions? Uh, just a question about the, the smoking policies. Uh, isn't it, is it federal law that smoking is prohibited on public school grounds, it's, or is it state law already? It's both. It's both already. Both. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and as, as usual, um, based on what I've seen of policy, we typically take those federal laws and adopt them as policy. Uh, pretty much pro se, and then add whatever it is necessary that we might feel, you know, that we feel is necessary to emphasize those things. Other questions or comments about these four policies that are being presented? John. Under ADC, on the second line, I think there's a misspelling. I don't understand that, that word. F-A-C-U-L-I. T-I-E-S. Which one are you on now, John? Oh, faculties. Facilities. ADC. Facilities. Yes. It should be facilities. That's correct. And another question. Under the ADC-R, under C, other persons in violation, is there an enforcement mechanism in that paragraph? Where's my copy? Right here. Um, yes, uh, so far as I'm concerned, in addition, all persons suspected of selling, distributing, or in any way dispensing tobacco products to students shall be referred to a law enforcement agency. We as a school do not have uh, jurisdiction on making an arrest or prosecuting an arrest. We can simply, and any, anyone can do it, and should refer it to a law enforcement agent this was my question at the last time it was the first reading, and this is addressing it, and this is making the enforcement uh, very positive. Well, the enforcement in terms of what the Cape Elizabeth Police Department is prepared to do, but we are basically directing that anyone who does not cease and desist when asked to will be referred to a law enforcement agency. And I think you can bet on seeing that happen real soon. Other questions? Seeing none, then all in favor? 7-0. Uh, we're now moving into um, new business. Uh, the first is the consideration of the superintendent's nomination to a teacher position. Yes, I wish to nominate Eleanor Campbell to a teaching position of first grade teacher at Pond Cove School, replacing Linda Neff. Is there a motion? I move we uh, adopt the superintendent's recommendation for Eleanor Campbell to first grade. A second? Second. John, any questions, discussion? We're hoping she will be with us soon. I know that's the question. But she is uh, currently employed as a first grade teacher in Minot. Uh, all those in favor? 7 0. Thank you. Excuse me, Tom, you have a start date for her, right? Don't you? No. The 27th or something? 
No. <laughs> it's changed. It might, it might be no later than because there is a 30-day out clause that she's being held to. If they find a replacement, she'll be here sooner. But uh, Nancy Rollis has called her, called Eleanor Ellie, and I've talked to her, and she'll probably be visiting soon. Oh, good. Yeah. Great. Next on our agenda is consideration of proposed school system goals for 1998-1999. Um, these are goals that um, have been set uh, by the board um, working very closely in conjunction with the administrative uh, team uh, for the school system. Um, I'd like to briefly re review these uh, goals for 98-99 and uh, before I do that I certainly want to um, just speak to the effort that was invested uh, by everyone involved. Uh, Last year, we did some, uh, some pretty good goal setting. The year before, it was good goal setting. I think we keep getting incrementally better at, um, at setting goals, um, specifically as it pertains to involvement and true discussion and exchange of ideas. I really feel that the goals that are being presented this evening are goals that were collaboratively developed um, by the board uh, and the administrative council. I'll take a few minutes to present these. It's on the very bottom. The um Apologize for turning my back. The first area uh, in terms of the goals has to do, of course, with academics and curriculum. And the big focus um, for this year is around the main learning results. The 98-99 Cape Elizabeth School System Academic Curriculum Goals will focus on teaching and learning with the guiding principle being to increase student learning. Um, part of that was to develop a long-term plan through the year 2002 to include short-term annual benchmarks and to ensure uh, that we're meeting standards of the main State learning results. Next is that each school would identify specific examples of interventions that they have developed or implemented to better meet the, the learning needs across the student populations. In some ways, we were asking for a demonstration from each school um, in terms of uh, sort of more immediate impact strategies that they were developing and using in the schools uh, specifically to meet the needs uh, across the entire student population. Um, we have framed two questions to be used uh, in terms of uh, looking at the uh, student needs issue and meeting needs across the continuum, and that is what strategies will be employed to ensure the wide spectrum of student needs is met, and secondly, what resources are needed. Also as part of this goal area, guidelines will be developed for the best use of staff development resources. We recognize that in order to make the continuous progress that needs to be made, um, we need to ensure that we're bringing our staff development resources along um, consistent with the, uh, the um, progress and the momentum that we're trying to build. Lastly, um, we will be uh, documenting how staff development resources have been used to address specific needs. There'll be a report to the school board at, uh, by June of 99. Uh, the administrative council will conduct a review of standardized tests, including uh, degrees of reading power, MEAs, CATs, etc. Uh, this is another aspect of uh, goals under the academic and uh, curriculum area where we really feel that we need a better handle on what tests are being administered, uh, the amount of time that's being invested, and answering the question, so what? We've done this testing, so what? How does it uh, impact our um, education system?
In the second goal area, systems administration, there are a number of pieces, um, a, a number of objectives that we've established. The first is to review current support staffing for technology K through 12 and make recommendations accordingly. Uh, essentially reviewing, making sure that we've got the resources um, that we need uh, in the area of technology K through 12. Uh, second objective is for the technology committee to develop a new rolling five-year plan. Uh, basically project out from now over the course of the next five years, they've been very successful and the system has been very successful in implementing a technology plan. We don't want to use, lose that momentum. We want to uh, make sure that we're always looking forward. The third objective is to develop a basic employee handbook uh, covering the legally mandated policy areas by June of 99. A fourth objective is um, uh, there is a committee, a supervision and evaluation committee. We'd like them to continue their work with a report back to the school board in June of 99. The fifth objective is to focus on the critical review of all probationary employees. This has been an ongoing focus for us. We feel it's a very important focus and um, wish to emphasize it again uh, by virtue of making it another objective under our goals. The last is to conduct a safety audit for all schools and to develop and put into place a basic critical incident response plan. And uh, there's no secret as we look across um, school environments uh, throughout the United States um, that it's only a prudent measure to make sure that we are developing um, a critical incident response plan and that we are uh, cognizant of um, uh, where we are audit-wise in terms of safety for the schools. The third goal area is organizational and individual development. This is how, we, how do we move the whole organization ahead and how do we ensure that individuals are always growing and learning. And there are two uh, focal areas here. The first is to continue the time usage team and implement um, and evaluate the initiatives that were outcomes from our discussions last year, looping, scheduling, and so on. Um, again, the focus for that team will be to broaden again the discussion and, uh, and keep that uh, focus alive. The second is to initiate an external review of Pond Cove for 98-99. Um, it was determined last year that we would um, each year uh, look to an external review so that we get outside feedback and we really uh, have some help in terms of identifying those areas for inter incremental improvement in each of our schools. 98-99 uh, is Pond Cove's year and uh, uh, Tom spoke about that review that's coming up. Um, Additionally, the middle school, which underwent a uh, review last year, will continue to take a look at their uh, response plan. And the high school will be uh, reviewed um, consistent with the cycle that they are already on. And Peter, I'm not quite sure when the next review would be. Okay. Um, the fourth area in terms of goals is general, and uh, these are a kind of a, quite a collection of things. The first is to review uh, job descriptions for administrative positions with emphasis on superintendent, assistant principals, and technology coordinator to get some um, clarity and specificity around those specific uh, job descriptions. And, and again, it's um, an attempt to uh, bite off that this year and, and move through that as we go um, in successive years. The second objective is to continue and increase the level of town council involvement with the schools. Uh, that was a successful initiative last year. We'd like to continue that. As well, we'd like to continue and increase participation level in the countywide school board committee. A number of uh, school board representatives and superintendents meeting together to discuss items that are of interest uh, regionally. And lastly, the fourth objective is to develop a process for conducting a superintendent search, which, which helps to ensure the success of the new superintendent. Um, and uh, we have a meeting coming up uh, this month uh, where we begin to um, uh, structure that process, and there will be more shared with the public about that. Uh, the last, I believe, 
area is uh, the fifth area, follow-up. And this is, again, continuation of um, uh, something that uh, was started and with good success this uh, started last year. We're seeing some very good response and success this year, and that is uh, continuing the standard for uh, syllabus requirement. Uh, for, at the high school and middle school levels, and we've asked Pond Cove to look at a similar tool. Um, as parents have attended curriculum nights, they have been presented with um, the different um, syllabi, I guess, for classes uh, at those levels with a lot of positive feedback. And lastly is to bring to closure the issue regarding full-time kindergarten. This was a study issue last year. Our feeling was, uh, okay, that's, we've studied it. Let's move on, let's come to closure, make some decisions, particularly as it may or may not impact the budget. And I believe that's it. Uh, that was the presentation of the 98-99 school board goals, and um, what I need is a motion. Yes. Um, before I make a motion, George, I thought we had one unresolved issue was the, uh, if we want to be as specific as saying we wanted a three or five year plan to bring foreign language um, down into the grades in the elementary school. And I'm not sure, we left it hanging on the drawing board. Um, and I think it is incorporated in the bullet one of academics and curriculum, although I do like the specificity of adding it so that we are sure it's done that when we get to budget planning, we have it as an option to do. So um, I guess I can go either way as long as we are sure we will have something to look at, um, that there is a plan. Judy Liberty is chairing that group, and I've told her that one of her charges is that she needs to have, her committee needs to have a recommendation relative to moving foreign languages down, and that recommendation has to be ready for the budget season. So. Do you, that, that's fine, um, as long as you know, we have the assurance that we'll have it. Was, it was one of the items that uh, was a discussion item. It got tabled, and uh, we... Um, completed our discussion and, and, and uh, remembered that we had, put, had sort of left that out. There was really no determination to add it or not, but there was some interest, certainly. Um, if that's a satisfactory um, outcome. My outcome is I just want to be sure it's done, and I don't really care if it's on this piece of paper or not, but that it's done. Other comments about that item or the, goal, or the goals in general? Seeing none, um, <clears throat> then I'd ask for a motion. Uh, Kevin. I move that we adopt the Cape Elizabeth School System goals for the year 1998 and 1999 as presented. A second. Jennifer. Discussion? There being none, all in favor? 7-0. Anyone who, uh, we went through that, I went through that pretty quickly. There's a lot of meat in those goals, as uh, the Administrative Council well knows. And anyone who might have questions can uh, speak with a member of the Administrative Council, the principals or assistant principals or the superintendent or board members. We'd be happy to um, uh, give you all of the um, sort of the background on any one of those items. We're going to move on to consideration of the superintendent's nomination to athletic fee positions for the fall and winter 98-99. I have one housekeeping issue, and that is one fall coaching position that was left over. I wish to nominate Chris Mullen to be the assistant cross-country coach, and that's at the middle school. The person we had nominated for that job was unable to do it, and so Chris has filled in. We need to make him official. Okay. And then for winter, we have a, quite a few, and I'll read the list. Uh, Jim Ray as boys vas varsity basketball coach, and this is his 12th year. Tom Robinson as the JV boys basketball coach, and this is his fourth year. Jerry McQueenie, freshman basketball coach, who was an eighth grade coach last year. 
Lisa Manning, Varsity Girls Basketball, this will be her second year. Marge Queen, JV Girls Basketball, second year. Carrie Curtis, Varsity Boys Swimming, and Carrie Curtis, Varsity Girls Swimming, this is his sixth year. Ben Raymond, Assistant Swimming, fifth year. Sean Russo, Varsity Ice Hockey, second year. Kurt Brown, Assistant Ice Hockey, second year. And Steve Willett, Assistant Ice Hockey, second year. Larry Greer, Head Coach Indoor Track, and this is his 16th year, that's the prize. Doug Worthley, Assistant Indoor uh, Track, and this is his third year. I also wish to nominate and thank John and Ann Upton, who do the High School Nordic Skiing Program for us, and they have again volunteered to do that. Okay, is there a motion? Yeah. Make a motion that we accept the superintendent's nomination for athletic fee positions. For both the fall and the winter. For fall and winter. Is there a second? Jennifer, uh, questions or comments? I have a question. Oh. Yes. <laughs> with, with varsity boys and varsity girls swimming, uh, do, they have, do they happen concurrently or do they always happen at separate times? Keith? The seasons are concurrent seasons, yes. I guess my, my question is, does it take 700 hours to do those two sports or? Oh, well, they have separate practices. Okay. That's good. Right. That's, that's don't, the question. Thanks. Don't sit down though, Keith. While you're up, what is your status of winter vacancies? This is your chance to. Uh, that uh, fulfills all of those, the high school, the next meeting will have all of those, the middle school. Great, thanks. Great. Okay, uh, other questions, comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? 7-0. Next is the uh, consideration of the superintendent's nominations to co-curricular fee positions for 98-99 school year. Okay, first I'm going to do the mentors for new teachers. Uh, Sarah Franklin to be the mentor for Lori Landers. Sally Martin to be the mentor for Susan Gifford. Ted Jordan to be the mentor for Greg Zandi. Tina Johnson as a mentor for Diane Tardiff. Scott Shea as a mentor for Deborah Jackson. Elaine Brownell as a mentor for David Greeley. Doug Worthley as the mentor for Beth Lewis. Judy Liberty as the mentor for Ben Raymond. Richard Roethlisberger as the mentor for Diane Brakeley. Skip Crosby as the mentor for Lynn Lockhart. And Andrea Kyer as the mentor for Kathy Van Dorn. Also in that same category, we need a high school representative to the certification committee and that would be Belinda Snell. Belinda is replacing Carrie Hall who retired uh, in August. You want me to do all the, all the co-curricular? I have some department heads, department head for fine arts, Norm Richardson, and in that same department, the theatrical technical assistant for set design, Peter Bloom. Also in the arts department, uh, Christopher Marsh to be jazz combo one and two leader. Okay. Um, is there a motion? Yeah. I move that we accept the superintendent's nominations for co-curricular positions as presented. And a second? Kevin, thank you. Um, Question? John? I have an explanation as to what entails being a mentor for a new teacher. Mm -hmm. I look down on the side here, teachers being supported. I, I could be wrong, but I thought Ben Raymond had been on our staff as a teacher and Diane Brakeley in the past. Those but names are familiar to me. They, they were just last year. They joined us as teachers. Just last year. Right. Ben Raymond was with us, but he was not a teacher until last year. Okay. And Diane Brakeley was with us, but she was not a teacher until this past year. I thought she was three quarters or seven eighths. Uh, she quarters. was last year. Last, last year. So she didn't have a mentor last year? Yes, yeah, she, yeah, she did. did. It's two years. It's two years. State, yeah, law, two years. state law requires that yeah. people have mentors as long as they're on a provisional right. or conditional certificate. Which, which usually is two years. Okay. That explains it. Thank you. Okay. Other questions, Jennifer? Yeah, I have a question. Is it if they have a provisional certificate or if they're probationary teachers? Probationary teachers. No. <laughs> provisional certificate. The state law requires oh, okay. if they have a provisional certificate or a conditional certificate. But we require it of all probationary teachers. Okay. okay. Um, other questions, comments? We don't. S seeing none, all in favor? 
1.70. Okay, this brings us to policy readings, first readings, Kevin. Um, this is brief, so I'll read the entire thing. Policy GBN, Family and Medical Leave. The Cape Elizabeth School Department shall comply with all applicable provisions of the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act of 1993, the Maine Family Medical Leave Law, and any other board policies and collective bargaining agreements regarding family and medical leave. The superintendent is responsible for implementing administrative procedures to comply with this policy. And it gives the legal references, uh, state and federal. Policy GBN-R1 and GBN-R2 are the administrative guidelines for implementing this, which spell out the eligibility requirements and administration. The only other thing that is important to note is that the school board has delegated to the superintendent the authority to make decisions on the first 30 days of additional leave beyond the maximum allowable leave. Thereafter, after that 30 days potential extension, any further extension must be directed to the board for our authorization. And th this is pretty standard boilerplate this policy. Is, this is boilerplate policy that simply says that we are obeying and administering existing federal law and our own collective bargaining agreements, which we have already signed. So um, again, it is pretty boilerplate. Okay. Um, comments? This, this is the first reading, so this will come up as the second reading, probably at the next uh, school board meeting. Okay. Um, We have a consideration of a teacher's request for maternity leave. All right, and I have two items under that, under 10F. First one is a request from Kathleen Van Dorn who, for maternity leave, and she expects to deliver her baby on November 3rd. Okay. Is that something we need to approve? Yes. Beth. I move that we ex um, accept the request for maternity leave for Kathleen Van Second. Marie, uh, questions or comments about this request? If none, then all those in favor? 7 0. And I have a second request on that same category a request from Mary Gray for child rearing leave, and she wishes to use six weeks of her sick leave for child rearing leave. And since that is not covered by current policy or benefit package, that has been passed on to the board. Um, it's my understanding that it was submitted as a request, Cynthia, to you, and um, based on uh, based on review of policy and based on sort of the past sentiment of the board, that was denied, and that this this employee has requested um, consideration by the, the school board. It's also my understanding that um, Mary Gray wished to have someone represent uh, this request. And if you'd like to come up to the podium and uh, please identify yourself. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Paul Bolger. I'm an attorney. I'm a friend of the applicant. Uh, I'm not here as an attorney. I have three children in the school system, uh, Anna, Max, and Caroline. Uh, two of my children are biological children. One is adopted from China. Caroline's adopted from China. She's a, in kindergarten this year. Uh, they're all, all three children, as I uh, count them, fortunate to be in the school system. You have an awful lot of business to conduct here tonight, and I'm going to try to be brief. Um, Mary, I'm standing in Mary's shoes tonight, and she is on her way to China. Uh, she is a central office employee, a transportation supervisor. Uh, 
she's um, uh, requested a leave, a paid leave, effectively by asking that her um, uh, a medical leave be ap applied to this this particular leave. Unpaid leave is available, obviously, by by law, and that's not the issue. Uh, she wishes to use her available sick leave credits for travel, recovery, and bonding with her new daughter. Um, the existing policy permits the use of sick leave for this purpose, you look at page three of the policy, by its terms, and I'll read it for the sake of those who may be listening in. Um, sick leave is on page three, but family medical leave and leave of absence is on page four of the written policy. It states that an employee with 12 consecutive months of full-time employment will be allowed up to eight unpaid work weeks leave of absence for the birth or adoption of a child or for serious illness. Immediate family members defined, excuse me, I should read the whole thing, uh, for, uh, or for serious illness of the employee or immediate family member of the employee. Immediate family members defined to mean spouse, parents, or step parents, children, mm -hmm. siblings, or stepchildren, or step siblings, and in laws. And then it states accumulated sick leave may be used with the approval of the superintendent. And now, uh, this is this language is lifted directly from the federal law, which is fine as far as it goes. The, the difficulty, I think, is that there are no criteria for which to govern a decision by the superintendent. Apparently, what's happened, and I think Dr. Moles could probably address this better than I could, but apparently, what has happened is that the sick leave policy has been read into this. And the sick leave policy states that each employee shall be entitled to sick leave with full pay for personal illness, disability, or accident at the rate of one day per month for each month of employment. It goes on to state um, that in the event of absence of an employee for illness, disability, or accident in excess of five consecutive work days, the superintendent may require the employee to submit to a medical examination by the school physician attesting to the employee's ability to return to work. Uh, that, in effect, is not what, been Mary's, what Mary has been told. She's been told a couple of other things. And this is not a criticism, mind you. This is what the policy is. And, and uh, I could point to the policy as being lifted from the federal law and not giving the superintendent a lot of guidance. Um, Excuse me a sec. Was that sick leave from the federal law as well that you were reading? Um, actually, no, that's actually, that's from the central office employee handbook. And Mar not, Mary is not an employee of the central office. So that's, well, that, that appears only in the, in the employee handbook for employees she, of the central office. She does have a question. She's a, she is asked repeatedly where she falls. And there's been some uh, <coughs> confusion about that. Her immediate supervisor hasn't been able to tell her with certainty. And perhaps Dr. Moles could, could tell us um, with with a greater degree of certainty actually what category she fits in. But she was last told by her immediate uh, uh, supervisor that she was a, she fell under the central office. Okay. Can we respond now? Sure. Uh, she, basically she was hired as an at-will employee, which means she's hired without a contract, and she was not hired as a central office employee. And I talked with Scott Poulin, who was the business manager at the time that she was hired, and he reaffirmed that, that she was never considered to be a central office employee. And that the document that she's included in here is part of the handbook for central office employees. And it does not relate directly to her. OK. Uh, in any case. Well, she must fall somewhere. She's an at-will employee of community services. So she would be covered by the federal law. And she'll be covered by this policy if it's passed, the policy that's at the first reading. But they don't have, she does not have a contract, nor does she have, they don't have uh, such specific policies. Do school board policies that are already adopted apply to all employees? Yes. Uh, going back to the policy itself, uh, the, I think the magic words are accumulated sick leave may be used with the approval <coughs> of the superintendent, quote unquote. And that leaves us with the question and what criteria would be used for making such a decision. And I think after some dialogue, 
what's been concluded is that for purposes of making these decisions that at least at one point Mary was told that pregnancy is an illness. And uh, secondly, that under most circumstances a, a note from a doctor is required, uh, although there seemed to be some uncertainty about that. I'm not sure whether the policy is that a note from a doctor is required if you're a pregnant woman ready to preparing to bear a biological child or postpartum having a, a, a biological child born into the family. Um, I guess because the policy itself does not state that a doctor's note will be required in order to take sick leave, it simply leaves it up to the superintendent to make the decision. And I only have to go on what the criteria that's been stated to Mary. And, and I don't know that I can be fair about this. Mary's been party to those discussions. I know she spoke to the chair about it. I know she talk, talked to Dr. Moles at some length. Um, I think at this point I would speak from the heart. And I would just say that uh, if the policy is that pregnancy is illness, I have to ask the question why. And I think that we'd all intuitively uh, might respond that because it, when a mother bears a child, there's a need for time period of recovery, that there is a certain bonding that needs to take place, that there might be actual illness, either of the mother or the child, uh, that all those can be anticipated. And there's also a lot of sleep loss, uh, as any parent can attest. Um, in going through those, those are values, I suppose, that are reflected in the policy. If, in going through those and the importance of, of leave to a parent in that situation, I could very easily take those and state that they apply in the case of an adoptive parent. Um, uh, perhaps even more so when my first child was born, and this is anecdotal, when my first child was born she was six weeks premature and she had uh, all kinds of medical problems. But I would say that uh, easily uh, adopting my little girl from China was much more taxing. It was more taxing financially, certainly. It was, but it was much more taxing physically on the entire family unit than was uh, having a biological child introduced to the family. Um, bringing a two-year-old into the house who doesn't speak English, who's never known any home but you know, a mat on the floor with 10 children in an orphanage uh, who is, doesn't speak to you for weeks on end trying to adapt and being up all hours of the night with night tears. I, I think th Dr. Moles addressed this with Mary, She's, and I think her response was, I, I understand that, and I'm in support of whatever support you can get, but I have a policy that I have to implement. And I understand that this is one employee in a very large system. But I do want you, want you to make, I want to make you aware of it. Um, I, I, I guess I don't want to get into criticizing the policy. I think the policy has been lifted from federal law. I will say that there is a bill in Congress just now with 70 co-sponsors that if the uh, Leave for Equity for Adoptive Families Act, which effectively states that, or will entitle adoptive families to the same benefit that uh, employees have for the birth of biological children. So Congress has, has at least identified the issue. It's not a law yet, and we may see a change in the law. Um, I'm, I'm just curious, will that, will that entitle both parents to, um, to, to this? I haven't thing? read the bill, to be honest with you, George. Um, I have a squib from an article on it, and what it states is that the Leave for Adoptive Families Act entitles employees who need leave because of placement of a son or daughter for adoption or foster care to any leave benefit provided by an employer to any other employee who needs leave either to care for a newborn biological child or to recover from the employee's own illness, injury, or disability. I would say this, and I'm sure Dr. Moles would say this, if we applied that right now and what we have in CAPE is a policy that doesn't automatically give paid leave to uh, a biological mother, then in fact a mirror of that 
would be, or if you say it another way, if you require a note from your doctor before you get paid leave, then Mary would be in the same position. Mary Gray would be in the same position today. Even with this act adopted, she would have to bring a note from her doctor. I don't know what the policy is because our policy doesn't say, one, that, you'll be, that pregnant women are treated as if they're ill, and two, that a note from your doctor is required. And um, I guess if, from an attorney's point of view, it's legally deficient in that regard, in that it vests in one person to make decisions without criteria, without governing criteria. So I don't know what decision I get from day to day. We can say the policy is broad. It is. It accommodates this application. <coughs> if I want to read into this that Mary Gray is entitled to receive this, I can find it in the current wording of this policy. Um, there, it's what's unstated in the policy that's created the problem. It, the, what's unstated in the policy is that biological mothers are treated as ill, and secondly, if you're ill, we're going to read the sick leave policy into it. Beyond five days, we require a written, or we can require uh, a doctor's or physician's examination. It doesn't say anything about a doctor's note anywhere in the policy. It says the school department can require a physical examination in the sick leave policy. But the practice is, and you're, everything you've said is correct, the practice is that uh, in maternity leave cases, we do require a doctor's note. So that even if one is having a baby naturally, such as the maternity leave that we just approved, she is not eligible for any leave automatically. That has to come with a doctor's note. And, and some doctors say five days, and some doctors may say six weeks. So it really, at that point, it's in the hands of the doctors. I mean, I think we are, certainly are at the point in medical care where maybe we need to have a discussion about the differences and the length of time. But the long-term practice has been with the doctors now. I'm curious as to, and I know the board should be asking the questions, but I'm curious as to what, and it may not be illustrative of an appropriate standard, but I'm curious as to what the experience is. When someone has re requests four weeks leave and attaches the doctor's note, the doc here's justification, my doctor says I need four weeks. In other instances, someone might request eight weeks. Is there any linkage between that and the number of credits someone has? Is there any, is that based upon individual circumstance? And how does it relate to a person's physical circumstances or other circumstances? Do, do they directly relate? Or is it, if we're talking about the integrity of sick leave policy and saying we protect it with a doctor's note, is there any relationship between the time the doctor says a person needs and what they actually need? And is there any way of measuring? This is a difficult issue, obviously. Obviously, um, it is a complicated issue. As a board, we have to be incredibly careful um, running a $12 million business with personnel we have in place is vitally important to the education of the kids and what we do here. And the way that the sick leave is set up and to be used, and we explain it every time we bargain with our five units, is sick leave is for when someone is sick. And it is not days that are vacation days, and it is not days to be used if you do not need them. It certainly does get complicated, and it's even more complicated with teachers who do not have vacation days to use if they really need to do something. That's not the case with Mary Gray. But it is, it is difficult. Um, if we start allowing sick leave days that are banked, and we are a very generous system in the amount of sick days we let employees have in almost all of our units, we find ourselves in a position where sick leave can be asked for a multitude of things, and a lot of them are wonderful things for might be caring for a very ill parent. It might be a child rearing incident, but it really gets lost in the shuffle. And we then have people who we are paying who are not in the classroom and doing the things that we need our employees doing that is so important. I feel for Mary needing to spend time with this child. We will encourage her to do that if it's a reduced schedule. But I cannot support using sick leave for 
what is not sick leave. And if we start saying we can use sick leave for child rearing, every man in this system, bus drivers, custodians, everything will have the right to paid sick leave for those kind of things. We would find ourselves in a, in a position that is just child rearing if the child is new to your family, or is it child rearing if you have a crisis? And what happens if it's more bonding with a new child? Then does it become bonding as an aging parent is dying? Um, we would open ourselves to a situation that we could not handle. In most cases of this kind of thing, we would say, let's go back to the bargaining unit and look at it the next time we open the contract and say, should we add a few days that are for, I don't know, more personal days or those kind of things. My understanding is Mary does not fall into any of the collective agreement groups, so she wouldn't be, and she is a at-will employee, and I assume of community services. And the way that we handle those is we just, um, I mean, Cynthia handles them. And her recommendation here, I mean, she has turned down this request and not turned it down because we don't think it's important that a parent bond with a child, but that the system isn't able to really handle this kind of situation and where it could lead us in the future. Other comments from the board? Jennifer? Um, in a regular maternity leave, are people able to use, I mean, is it out of, is, are they able to use sick leave and just have a doctor's note, which, I mean, in most maternity cases, a doctor, any doctor will write a note that says you have to stay home for six weeks. That's what's required and that's what's usually okay. gotten. If they have six weeks sick leave. In other words, they're not given sick leave if they have not accrued that. Right. But up to six weeks. And otherwise, it's an unpaid leave. That's right. Is that how it works? Right. Um, but, but only if, it, in other words, they can use their sick leave only if the doctor says they are unable to return to work. I Which is the same requirement for anyone who's on sick leave. All doctors would give that no. Um, my question is I think that. Um, Mary actually called me. She believes that she falls under central staff. She was never, she was never told that officially by me. She yeah. believes that she was told that. I'm just saying yeah. what she told me. She believes that she was told that she falls under s central staff. Um, and I believe that she's sort of in a peculiar situation of she could get this leave if she wants to sort of lie about being sick. Um, and that puts her, I think, in an awkward position. I'm just well, no, you're saying that she would have to go to a doctor and ask a doctor to lie to get a sick a note. Doctors routinely give them to people who have just had a child that they should stay home for six weeks. Yes, but they're giving it with and their... And they're not... Nobody's sick who's home for six weeks with their kid. And those are routinely given. I guess that those are the issues that I'd like to bring up. Ke um, Kevin had a comment. Well, I suppose, and I... Please understand that I'm not lecturing, but a woman who gives birth has experienced an extraordinary number of hormonal changes. I'm not going to get into the gory details, but those of us who are parents know that there are certain things that continue after the birth of the child for a considerable period of time. Um, there are issues of depression, postpartum depression, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I see that there is, I don't ever remember the principle of allowing a woman six weeks off after the birth of a child as having anything to do with bonding. We were certainly not enlightened enough, and I don't think we are still enlightened enough to say that that period of time is for bonding. That period of time is recovery from a significant physical trauma, basically. Um, and while I am entirely sympathetic to Mary's request, 
I certainly feel the need to take a step back and look at all of the policies that are in place, all of the things that are in the collective bargaining agreements, and these re this request was not timed in such a fashion that I'm able to do that, and I'm not prepared to make an emotional decision tonight on this issue. I would, I guess, in response to that, she had asked for the policy when she was hired and only with a considerable amount of effort was she able to get it just in the past couple of weeks. Um, it was her impression that no one knew what the policy was with any certainty or wasn't willing to share it with her, and she was disturbed by that. Um, I don't, uh, I guess in terms of medical illness, I'm as much concerned about the child she brings back from China who will undoubtedly uh, be sick in one way or another. Um, these children are malnourished, not necessarily outwardly, but they have scabies, they are, have vitamin deficiencies, they have bad teeth, bad gums, uh, bad digestive tracts, and they do not sleep. And um, I know Pam Wright is here in the audience, she's a Cape resident. She's here to speak to that issue as a biological mother and an, a, a mother who is adopted from China. I, <coughs> I've not gone through that the way my spouse did, but I did secondhand, or I should say, say I was certainly part of the process. But I can tell you, I, I'm just telling you, maybe it's anecdotal, my own experience was that it was far more challenging to bring a, a child home from China with integration issues uh, se uh, uh, separation issues that are uh, well documented um, and that require ongoing help. Um, and uh, that critical period when I brought her home, she had an illness, it might have been psychological, it might have been, it was also physical, but it required uh, the, that somebody be home with her at all times. Um, Mary wanted to be honest about her application and say, I know if I were a biological mother, I'd make the, I would make, make this request. I'd have a doctor's note. I don't want to go get a doctor's note in anticipation of bringing home a sick child. I would prefer to be upfront about it, and that's what she's doing. I understand. And my does comments. Does currently allow, and I talked with her about this, five days for illness in the family so that she could start with that. She would then, granted, she would then have to come back if, in fact, the baby proved to be ill beyond that period of time. But but she was unwilling to do it on that basis. She wanted the six weeks up front, which I did not feel I could give her. And uh, I was not commenting on the physical condition of the baby, either through a, uh, an actual birth or through adoption. It happens that I am very familiar with the condition of adopted children, as my brother adopted a Yugoslavian child some years ago. So I, I am familiar with that. I am, I'm commenting strictly on the mother's physical condition. Um, and again, you know, as I said, I, I have an emotional response that, and I am not prepared to make a decision based on that emotional response. Your comments are well taken. Um, you said that there's a, an, um, someone else present who would like to speak and, and, um, and we'd like to offer that opportunity right now. And then I, I think what I'd like to do is if, there, if the board has any questions of either of the presenters, they'll uh, ask those questions. And then I'd really like to um, uh, get the, a sense from each of the board members as to um, uh, how they're feeling about this and, and, uh, and where we go from here so that we can uh, move through this. Thank you. I don't want to, are you, are you all set? Well, I have set, one George. question. Okay. The, when you read this family medical leave federal thing and then you, Respond, uh, mentioned something about um, how, what the criteria for sick leave was, were, excuse me. Where, where were you reading that from? Okay. The Cape Elizabeth School Department personnel policy for central office support staff. Okay, so that's not on here. I don't have no. that. What we you don't were have reading. that. Page three. Um, I thought the materials that Mary circulated. No, she only circulated just the one page. Okay. Just the one page. I'm sorry. Okay. And again, I was I'm I wasn't sure whether the sick leave policy was being read into 
the family medical leave of absence policy, but it appeared to be somewhat uh, that that was the case. That is, the, the family medical leave and leave of absence policy which you have simply states that the accumulated sick leave may be used with approval of the superintendent. Right. That's all it says. Right. And, and, and then this idea or concept that a medical exam or doctor's note was required. Um, and that's from the central office. That's, well, that's in almost all of our yes. contracts, right? Under, after five days that we can require There's doctors. a separate stated sick leave policy beginning on th page three, which is the page prior in the same, the same policy materials. Okay, which I talks know. about the specifics of sick leave and when an, a sick leave can be extended beyond five days. Can you? Yeah, that's, as that I say, that's that? the same in most contracts. I don't have that. Can I, can I give you this page? You want to take it? Yeah, I just want to look at it. Actually, you can have my entire copy. I'll give it back. Pam, do you want to come up? You're, uh, you're welcome, Mr. Bolger, to stay up there. We may have other questions, too. And if you could just identify yourself for us, please. Yeah. Uh, my name is Pam Wright. And I live on Ocean House Road. I'm a Cape resident and taxpayer. I'm also a teacher. And being a teacher, I love to bring visual aids. Um, the mother of Cameron May from China, age three, and Callie, uh, born to me biologically a year and a half ago. Um, and I, too, am here on behalf of Mary Gray, um, who is somewhere over the Pacific right now. And um, I was feeling badly that she left on this trip, kind of worrying about this issue. So I felt like uh, it was a good opportunity to come and express my points of view um, and to share some of my experiences, both as a teacher and a biological parent and an adoptive parent. That's um, right. Uh, if I could just interrupt, uh, this will not take more than five minutes, will it? Absolutely okay, not. Great. Probably two. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and my goal in this is that you will revisit your adoption policy um, as my school has had to do. Um, adoption is a wonderful way to expand a family and the arrival of our adoptive daughter brought us as much joy as our biological daughter. Um, the process itself is extraordinarily difficult, however, um, in order to get to a decision where you decide I'm going to adopt a child. Usually you've endured some kind of har hardship like fertility issues. Um, and there's a home study that's required that can feel very invasive. The paperwork is overwhelming and can often take six months or more to complete in triplicate, authenticated, replicated, everything else. Um, the travel to the foreign country can be frightening for some and can require lengthy stays. Some people have been trapped in countries like Peru for months at a time and cannot leave. Um, and the children themselves experience a lot of grief, even if they're merely infants, um, removed from their primary caregivers and the only setting they've ever known. For older children, there may be multiple placements during their lives, um, which affect the way that they attach to their new parent parents and there may be language barriers, and the cost to adoptive parents is in the twenty to $25,000 range. So many new families return from their trip with viral infections themselves, um, an unfamiliar child that is their own forever, at heavy debt, and my concern is a workplace um, that does not treat them in a way that's equal to the way they treat biological mothers. Um, I was very fortunate in that um, my school treated me very fairly. And returning to the workplace, I'm speaking as a teacher now, it made all the difference in the world. I felt like my community was celebrating with me. I had been treated fairly. Um, my child and I were just welcomed back into the community with open arms. And uh, teachers who feel good about their place of work and employees of any sort are going to do a better job for the school department. 
So I hope that you will reconsider your adoption policy. Many women are postponing childbearing into their 30s and 40s, so this is not the last time you'll see this issue come across your desk. And um, I just thank you for hearing my comments tonight. Other questions that uh, board members have for Pam? I have a question. Uh, you said that uh, your school system treated you in such a way or whatever. What was the, for the adoptive um, leave, what was the, the arrangements that were made? I had um, <clears throat> four weeks of paid leave plus um, a time period unpaid that was negotiated on an individual basis. So I personally took eight weeks, um, four <laughs> weeks paid, four weeks unpaid. Was that, that and was that deducted from accumulated sick leave time? No, it was not. It was. It, it was, was a part of a parenting leave. A parenting leave. In your contract, was it a negotiated item or a policy item? It was a policy. Uh, Kevin, I I may have missed it, but what school district do you teach in? I work at Wayne Fleet School. Excuse me. Wayne Fleet School in Portland. Private, right? Yes. Would you mind? If you could obtain a copy of the policy and certainly getting it to me, Kevin Sweeney, in care of the school department. Sure. Thank you. Other questions? I think the revisiting of our policies that relate to adoption leave, I don't think anyone here is questioning that. I mean, I think that's obviously with changes in the federal law and the fact that we have our policies on tonight for a reading. You don't need to convince us of that. I think the, the question is the immediacy. Yep. I have another question. Um, is, is Mary, uh, yeah, Mary, is she a full-time employee? No, she's a part-time employee. She's a scheduler in the community services. There was an error in the letter. So that the sick leave that she's looking for at 28 hours, that's full-time for her? Yes. <coughs> um, yeah, she works 30 hours, 30 hours a week for 38 weeks a year is her schedule. And so she accumulates sick leave, annual leave, and she also gets two personal days a year. Um, for uh, a pregnancy leave, um, if, there were, if there was a teacher who worked part-time, would the rules be different? No, it would be the same thing. They can use the two items as far as the maternity leave is concerned. As one is a doctor's note, and you can use with pay your sick leave up to the extent that you've accumulated. If you have two weeks, then beyond that, it would be without pay, so it depends on what you accumulate. And they accumulate based on their part-time status. Okay. And if this were granted, if she ultimately got sick... She would have no time. She would have, she could be out, but she wouldn't be paid. That's correct. Right. Right. Or, by the, or the reverse is, um, I, I think it was uh, the attorney who mentioned that if she were to come back with a virus or something, then obviously her sick leave would automatically come into play, the sick leave that she currently has. So and if, if, in fact, that, that occurred, that would, that's a non-issue as far as, the, because she does have sick leave. The issue is if she is not ill, can she use her sick leave? I mean, there's no question that she can use her sick leave if she comes home and she's ill. What if the child's ill? She, well, there it's five days, illness in the family, and then you can request an extension of that if the child is ill. So there are provisions for that if there is, in fact, an illness. The issue here is, that at this point we have no knowledge of the illness. She's been told the baby is healthy, et cetera. I'd, I'd just like to add one thought, and that is uh, I recently read in, in the paper the policy to be adopted, I think, by Union, uh, Unum regarding uh, partners, um, domestic partners, following uh, the main <coughs> medical center policy and awarding benefits to domestic partners. And what, and, and, one thing that they pointed out that was that the overall cost to the system was about 1%, so they could see that there were going to be tremendous benefits to those employees of the system. Now, whether or not that's true, I don't know, and I don't trust everything I read. However, I, w I would like to make one point regarding this particular narrow set of circumstances, and that is I don't think there are too many people that would choose to adopt domestically at a cost of 10 to $15,000 or adopt a child internationally at a cost of twenty to $30,000 and 
come in and, and uh, try to write, play the system, if you will, as a, as a means or method to subsidize what they're doing. I think people find themselves in circumstances in life. Uh, they plan this much as you would plan a pregnancy, but we're talking about a very narrow segment of the population. Um, I think that this school board could probably project how many people are going to find themselves within the system in this circumstance in the next five years, in the next ten years, fairly easily uh, based upon prior experience. And I would dare say that it's a, it's a, this is a very narrow set of individuals that we're talking about who would be making application for this leave. And this is a family supportive, uh, p potentially, uh, depending on what policy you adopt and what decision you make, it, you, could attempt, you could potentially make a, a, a very important decision that will be very supportive of, of the family unit, which is at least in part what I look to in, uh, from the school system. Um, good healthy kids with good healthy attitudes coming into the schools where they're going to be educated and where they're going to have a sense of community. It, and I it know, does have know, a slightly broader application though. We did have two requests last year from dads who wish to have paternity leave. So, I mean, there are other, for the school system as a whole, there are other ramifications. Yeah, fathers need to bond as well as mothers. Right, and in one case, the father, it was a baby that we knew was going to be born with a serious illness. Um, so and, and there were there were obviously other issues that are related to this. That's correct, right. and and I don't mean to 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 uh, miss those, downplay them. Uh, I acknowledge those. I think that uh, uh, there has to be. It's almost what I'm asking for, or what I'm suggesting or advocating is there's got to be a primary caregiver for this new child in this type of family, special circumstances, physical, psychological, the whole nine yards. Yes, Did you Beth. have a paid leave when your child was adopted? <laughs> no, I didn't. I can take a leave any time I want, <laughs> but I don't, I don't get paid, no. No. And did your husband have a paid leave? He did not. Um, to my recollection, no, he did have to take an extension of his vacation um, because uh, we were in China for more than two weeks. And then there was a recovery time because we were all there about 100. I understand this child will have a, a caregiver at home for six weeks with a paid leave, so this would be an additional caregiver. That's correct. Mm -hmm. what, I, um, what I would like I to do I, is to... I don't know that myself, Beth, but I... No, that's, that's what Mary told me. Okay. What, what I would like to do is um, to invite the board to, uh, you know, um, direct any additional questions that they might have for you now. Um, and then I'd really like to get a sense of the sentiment of the board around this particular issue, and I would like to move on. Um, so are there other questions for either of our presenters? Jennifer? I have, I have one question. Um, the, is whatever she falls under, <laughs> do accumulated sick, di di sick days reach a maximum and then they start to lose them? I don't, Pauline, do you know the answer to that? I don't know what the maximum is. Um, there is a maximum. And then you don't accrue any more over that certain number, but you don't know what the number is. No, I can look it up. No, it's, it's 135 days. For most most, of, the, most of the employees, right, it's 135 days. Which is fairly significant. Keith? Uh, Cynthia, she's an employee of community services. Are any of the other employees of community services under central office staff? No, no. They're, they're really their own unit right. if, if we look right. at it that way. Other questions, John? Uh, I don't have a question, but I would Comment. appreciate if uh, Dr. Mole Cynthia would restate the reasons why she declined the request so we would know specifically how it was phrased so the community will understand because I think they've had to absorb a lot of various information tonight and gets to be confused. Right. Basically, she was asking for to use six, week, six weeks of sick leave um, for child rearing, and we do not have, that's not a benefit that's entitled in any of our contracts, and we have not allowed that to any other employee. I researched back and could not find that. So under those circumstances, I felt that I needed to deny it based on the paperwork that I had and pass it on to the board or she opted to pass on to the board. I told her that was her next option. But at this point, anyone who's using sick leave 
and this system has to provide us, after five days, has to provide us with uh, a doctor's note, if so requested. Cynthia? Yes. Um, what does community services fall under? They're, they're a unit in and of themselves. So they have their own contract? No, they do oh. not have a contract. And they they're at-will employees. They're what we call at-will employees. Everybody at community services? Mm -hmm. I don't know about Sue, Pauline. She's an at-will employee as well? Yes. I believe so. Mm -hmm. She has a negotiated contract. She has an individual Right. But none of them are covered by any collective bargaining unit. We have a few, just a few at-will employees in the system. Yes, Kevin. For at-will employees, since they don't have a contract spelling out what their benefits are, what do they have that spells out their benefits? Yeah, the, bus the business office. But I mean, one of the things that I've learned from this is that we have a unit that's functioning with much less paperwork than the rest of the system. So we're that, going to need to formalize that. Be, but right. do we have anything that spells out the benefits for the community service employees? We must have something that states I mean, the, mm -hmm. day. Yes. They right. must. Personnel right. Personnel Can I get a copy, please? Okay, um, so uh, I guess what I would do is invite now um, comments uh, from board members. And maybe if I can start down this end, Marie, would you like to make any comments? Um, well, I guess, you know, my only comment is, is really kind of a question. Um, are, are we saying that because someone is adopting a child, um, they, they don't, and theoretically, I'm talking it, um, not in terms of policy that's here, um, but in terms of somebody adopting a child, do they have um, less benefits or, the, or there is something that's different about that versus um, delivering your own child biologically? I mean, I believe that um, both situations um, are very stressful and once the baby's here whether you deliver it or whether it appears in your home um, a lot of people in your family go through a lot of changes <coughs> especially the mother if the if the mother is is dealing with that child um, and there are a lot of different emotions and a lot of stresses that I think both situations um, endure and I guess that's just kind of a question. Is this so different because one is biological and one is not? Jennifer, would you like to make any additional comments? Um, yeah, I, I feel a little bit better knowing that there is someone at home on paid leave. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, but in an effort, I mean, maybe we could compromise. Um, I mean, we can almost anticipate that there'll be some issues with this child upon arriving home. And maybe uh, we could not grant six weeks, but grant, you know, two weeks or something and uh, compromise in that way so that Okay. Just throwing that out. That's fine. That's what I invited. <laughs> it's down there, Keith. Uh, it, obviously, a difficult decision. I, I think that the board has a responsibility to both the employees and uh, to the town as a whole. Uh, I think that we do offer comparable good benefits to all of our employees. The, I hate trying to write policy on the fly like we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, my sense is that this should not fall under sick leave. But I would be willing at some point to come up with some sort of agreement in this situation. Okay. Kevin, additional comments? 
under the circumstances, I would have to support Cynthia's decision on that, uh, as stated. And I have already stated very emphatically, I will not be put in a position to make any further decision on that tonight. However, I do think we need to examine policies that are in place that tempt our employees to lie to us. There's too many bloody many policies like that, both in the school system and in private industry and everywhere else. Um, and I think we need to re-examine some of these issues, but it's not going to happen tonight. John? I have to support the uh, superintendent's decision. I believe based on the way it was presented, it's the proper way to go. We shouldn't be making changes in the policy. I sympathize with Mary. I also want to thank the two indi individuals for coming tonight. They did a, an excellent job in making the presentation, but I would have to uh, support Cynthia in reference to her decision. Beth, do you have um, additional comments? No, I'll just support Cynthia. I'm happy to look at some kind of adoption policy that we come up with that's specific to adoption, <coughs> not just child rearing. We open ourselves to a whole can of worms if we grant something for child rearing. That could be for a child who's 15 and getting into trouble in the law. Somebody gets six weeks of leave in the middle of, we could just get into a huge problem. So I'm happy to look at something to do with adoption, but I, um, right now, the way things stand, sick leave is something that requires a doctor's note, and that's what it should be used for, and we can look at other options for other kinds of leave. Um, we talked about this with leave of absences. We've got a whole sort of, a lot of stuff we need to figure out so we're consistent and we don't get ourselves into trouble. Okay. Um, it's just a couple of comments. I think that, um, I'm one who's uh, very supportive of maintaining the integrity around sick leave, uh, sick leave for personal incapacitation and or to within the, uh, the constraints of a policy for the illness of a fa uh, an immediate family member. Um, so I, I feel strongly about that. Secondly, I think um, what was presented in terms of the, the uh, language around family medical leave and leave of absence, um, while the sentence uh, accumulated sick leave may be used with the approval of the superintendent is tagged on to the more boilerplate language. I think that, you know, I read that as a business person um, and make interpretations about that um, in a way that says that it's accumulated sick leave may be used within the parameters of sick leave approval um, uh, for, you know, based on the, uh, uh, the, um, with, with the approval of the superintendent. And I think that what's, what's being talked about earlier is the serious illness of a family member. And I think that that's <coughs> basically how that connects. Um, I, I think we're really, I think Mary has brought up a very good point. Uh, there's uh, some sense that, um, that physical birth um, requires six, six weeks of leave and I'm not really sure that that's the case any longer, um, if not, medically um, indicated then what is the other time you know that that is not medically indicated I think it, you know it, it really requires some examination I certainly do support the superintendent's decision it was the right decision she's followed the sentiment of the board um, as indicated to her earlier um, on the flip side so, so that I would say that would stand as it is but on the flip side I think Mary shows a lot of integrity by taking this thing head-on um, and, and presenting this question to us. It's a good one. It's, uh, there's some compelling arguments here. And I'm hearing um, that the board would probably like to revisit this as a policy issue. Um, I guess I would like to state further and, and see what my, my fellow board members feel. If, if we are to make some change, um, I think that given uh, sort of her leadership on this issue, uh, we would like to uh, perhaps extend that uh, benefit to her if there's one to be derived from any policy change, although it would be sort of perhaps after the fact. And um, uh, because I think that it is an important issue that she has, there are ways to have worked around this and, it, and we wouldn't be talking about this thing. And, uh, and I think that we're only gonna benefit by moving ourselves ahead and thinking through an issue like this. And, um, uh, and it is important in terms of setting the right tone for the work environment that we have, so. Um, would, would others agree, I'm hearing others talk about um, 
moving this to a policy discussion. This is really, it's kind of difficult. Kevin's not saying emphatically he's not going to talk about it anymore tonight. Um, I don't think that it's an appropriate uh, um, forum at this point to discuss it further, but perhaps the policy um, subcommittee would be appropriate. Is that the, the consensus of this board? So that's what we would like to do. Um, again, do appreciate uh, uh, Mr. Bolger and Ms. Wright for um, uh, helping us this evening uh, think through a, a difficult, very complex issue. Um, I can't promise that this board is going to have an immediate resolution on this, but we will get working on it. Other uh, comments or one, questions? One last question. Yeah. She is able to take yes. leave unpaid. Yes, right? absolutely. That's not an issue at all. No, no, that is not an issue. No, she may take the leave. She does not lose any benefits. Final question. Um, assuming they get back from China and the baby is ill, mm -hmm. then the regular terms of everything else kicks in. At that point, family, right. family leave yeah, act kicks in. Okay, thank you very much. Um, moving on now to um, the, the next to the last item under new business, um, consideration of the superintendent's nomination of assistant principal at the Pond Cove School. I was just looking to make sure Tom was still here, whether he'd give it up. <laughs> uh, with great pleasure, I'd like to nominate for the board's consideration Mala Bono, who is a resident of Scarborough, to be the new assistant principal at Pond Cove School effective as soon as she is. I need a motion. And Kevin, you have your hand up. I move that we accept the superintendent's nomination uh, for a new assistant principal at um, Pond Cove, Marla Bonham. Bonham. Um, is there a second? Second. <laughs> John, um, is, there dis is there discussion, comments? I just. I for the sake of those who perhaps haven't been here at earlier meetings, we had uh, about 46 or 47 applications. From that group, the initial interview committee interviewed seven, and from that group, the field was narrowed down to three finalists, and the board interviewed all three of those finalists this evening, earlier this evening. Um, any other comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Seven zero. Moving on, last, uh, last item here, uh, substitute pay, Keith. Uh, I guess I'll make a motion first and then a couple of comments. I'd like to move that we increase our substitute pay from the current $50 per day level up to $75 uh, with a possible estimated change in our budget line of approximately $50,000. Um, this, will, this will go to the substitute line is that, is that correct? For this time, at this point in time. From someplace else. <laughs> okay. Not much. Well, we'd first expend what we have in there, yes. and then. That's right. That's right. Okay. I'll second his motion. Thank you. Um, Just a question. Effective immediately is your intent once, if the motion is passed? Yes, I would say it would be effective immediately. Uh, the reality of the market is, is uh, our $50 per diem rate hasn't been changed in 10 years. Uh, Area schools around here are, are all at least at, at 65 or 75 with as high as 90. Uh, and we're unable to get uh, substitutes, uh, even find anybody to come in and be substitutes. And uh, this, this will hopefully uh, improve the situation a little bit. Uh, just to review some of the minimum requirements, if there's any uh, uh, listeners out there that, that might be interested in substituting, uh, the requirements are quite uh, uh, generous, and uh, they just uh, include a high school diploma plus one year of college, and you are eligible to be a substitute teacher. Uh, and uh, we hope to be contacting you uh, in, in the near future. And it's a very rewarding occupation. <laughs> <laughs> any parents? Yeah, and also parents, would be, uh, any parents interested in doing this uh, would be a great help. Is there further discussion on this topic? Seeing none, um, all those in favor? 7-0. And um, I believe that was the last item. What I'd like to do is just quickly, dates to remember, um, the town council meeting, the pool referendum information is uh, yesterday. 
yesterday. <laughs> um, so I hope you enjoyed that. Um, it's the school board policy subcommittee meeting Thursday, October 15th at 8.30 a.m. in the William H. Jordan Conference Room. Um, and Kevin, as chair, um, we made some promises this evening that that committee will, will need to um, uh, fit into their agenda. Special school board meeting, uh, meeting with uh, staff from the Maine School Management Association, the topic of which is the superintendent search. That's happening Monday, October 19th uh, from 7 to 9 p.m. And that will be followed by an executive session on the same topic. Um, the school board workshop meeting on October 27th 7 p.m. in the middle school library, and that was the topic that was addressed by Nancy Hutton earlier, which is middle school programming, uh, finance subcommittee meeting, Tuesday, November 10th, 1998, 6.30 p.m. at the William, Jordan, William H. Jordan Conference Room, and it will be followed by the regular school board meeting at 7.30 in the council chambers. Uh, the referendum, just as a reminder, on the pool is November 3rd, 1998. Which is election day. Which is election day. Am I missing anything? If not, then... Point of clarification. Uh, in reference to the meeting on the 19th at 7 to 9, the public is invited and will be able to partake? That's correct. That's a public meeting. It's not a discussion. It's not a discussion. It's, it's, it's a presentation. Presentation. Right, but they but, but it's a public it's, meeting. It's a public meeting. Yeah. Yes, Jane. So that will then be followed by an executive session to discuss items of, of personnel. Okay. Right. Correct. Um, that being the case, uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved and seconded by Kevin. All those in favor? 7-0. Uh, Thank you very much.